Welcome back to another episode of the Trees and Lines podcast. Beth Lay, Director of Resilience and Reliability at Lewis Tree Services Incorporated, joins us to talk about innovations in safety, how it is constantly evolving, and what defines success for her. We had a great conversation with her. Have a listen. Hope you enjoy. Well, welcome, Beth. It's great to have you with us. We've been looking forward to this episode. Uh, before we get started, would you give us uh, just a little brief, you know, about your background, what you're doing today, and let us know who you are? Sure. Thank you. I am the Director of Resilience and Reliability at Lewis Tree, and I know that's a somewhat unusual title. In fact, it's a fairly new title for me, but it really fits exactly what I do. So my background is uh, resilience engineering and highly reliable organizing. I also have a, a degree in cognitive science. I'm a mechanical engineer, um, and I've so uh, I've worked in the domain of human performance and resilience engineering, risk management for a lot of years now. And uh, so I guess that's my background. I've had an opportunity to work in a variety of industries, a variety of places, but mostly in the energy industry. Okay. Hey, I'm a forester, so help me out here. What's resilience engineering? Oh, boy. That's that's always my favorite question and also the hardest question to answer. So um, resilience engineering is about uh, engineering systems that respond well when challenged. So you can think about um, uh, traditional safety and human performance being able to manage work as it's normally occurring. But we know with highly variable work or when you're working in the extremes of environments that you're always going to be surprised. So resilience engineering is a lot about how you prepare to be surprised. And I know that's kind of a strange thing to think about, but it is um, it's first of all realizing how often we're surprised and then being ready for it, being ready to manage that surprise by being flexible, by adapting not only your systems, but helping the people be ready for that. Beth, do you outsource this for children? I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old, and I'd love to apply that system to them, if possible. No, I'm kidding. I, yeah, it's so funny that you say that, because actually a lot of people have told me that they apply some of the things, some of the uh, practices that we're using in their personal life, okay. including asking that question, uh, what surprised you pretty often. Um, so try it. Try it oh, this yeah. evening. I, I think I'm going to. This is, this is going to be yeah. the most informative part of my day. Um, so, so, so that's what you do. Maybe you could just give us a little snapshot of your career. Like, you know, you, you mentioned you have been in the energy industry. Um, maybe just take us through a few of the key kind of places that you implemented some of this, um, these structures, uh, what was the impact where you are now? And, you know, are you agnostic to industry and is resilience engineering essentially this, you know, have you been able to commoditize it and apply it and where you get effective results, regardless of whether we're talking about healthcare, energy, the tree business, you know, et cetera. So I'd be very interested to see the evolution of that. Okay. Uh, I'll describe it as best I can. Yeah, so of um, I started out, I started out as an engineer at Siemens, Siemens Energy, oh, and ba wow. way back when it was Westinghouse, yeah. actually. And then Siemens bought Westinghouse. And so I guess one of my first roles where I really began to implement some of the ideas was I stood up a risk management group for field service. And these are the, the teams that drop in whole uh, tractor trailer loads of tools and people to, uh, to uh, disassemble, inspect, upgrade, and modify the turbine. So the heart of the power plant, although some may disagree with me on that one. But um, so I basically stood up a risk management team that managed those type of projects and also we invented a process called real rapid risk assessment it was actually uh siemens trade siemens trademarked it and it was called rapid risk assessment which was a process wherein our team let's just say you're you have a project manager project manager on a power plant site and they come into some, some unexpected situation and uh we would always carry a, a you know a at that time, believe it or not, it was a beeper, right? Uh, or no, I'm, take that back, rewind, rewind. Uh, we, we carried a cell phone and we were on call 24-7. So we would get a call 
And within an hour of being called, we would convene a risk assessment, usually of around 10 people, and it'd be a quick conversation where we explored the emergent risk and came up with a plan of action. And it was the weirdest thing because once we started doing this, um, just, okay, let's just say we got a, a call on a certain topic, and we would say, send out a note to a handful of people and say, hey, we need to know who's got knowledge or expertise in this one area. And it was almost like magic to me where within like five minutes, 10 minutes, we would have surfaced the exact expertise that we needed. And sometimes we would already be in the risk assessment when the person would be identified and would call in. So it was really super fast and a really effective way to identify knowledge as it currently exists in an organization. So that was, I I think, probably the first time that I invented a process that was really uh, um, resilience engineering focused. Uh, So that was a little segue, but let's go from there. That was was Siemens, right? That was a Siemens, Siemens Field Service. Then went from there to Calpine, and at Calpine, I was the director of human performance, where we were implementing human performance uh, at all the power plants. They had about 90 or so gas turbines at that point in time. And while I was working as the director of human performance at Calpine, I got this call from NASA, and I it was uh, I was sitting at my desk one day. It was lunchtime, and I get this call. Where in the the person says, um, I'm from NASA Engineering and Safety Center, and just wondered if you'd be interested in exploring a project with us. And I'm like, uh, is this real life? And so <laughs> it turns out it was. And so the project was really interesting, and it was essentially three years post uh, an astronaut almost drowning during a spacewalk. They wanted to know the answer to the question, could this happen again? So I was able to join a team to uh, go in and interview folks, including astronauts, and wa- watch space walks for mission control. And looking at it all from a resilience engineering perspective, that's how they found me, is they were looking for someone who was practically applying resi- the ideas of resilience engineering. So moving on from that, um, I uh, ended up uh, working at Lewis Tree, which I that's where I work right now. And I work at Lewis because they were looking for someone who does safety differently. Uh, our CEO at that time, Tom Rogers, was looking. He knew that what they were currently doing wasn't working, which was heavy behavior-based safety. And uh, it only got them so far. So he was looking for someone to lead safety in a different way. And that's what drew me to uh, going to Lewis Tree. And then that began my experience in the vegetation management and line clearance world. So since I've been there, I've had the opportunity to do a couple of projects. And one of the most interesting ones has been supporting a a group called Sub-C7. And they do... um, they repair oil platforms in the deepest depths of the ocean. So, for example, in the North Sea and in the Gulf of Mexico. So I've been able to work with a colleague, David Proven, in helping uh, redefine what the principles of human performance and new view safety are based on the ideas of resilience engineering and highly reliable organizing. So, and yesterday I had the super cool experience because I was just thinking about this. Um, You know, I've, had the opportunity to work at the highest heights, right, with outer space, with NASA, with um, subsea seven, the deepest depths of the ocean. And then yesterday, I had the opportunity to tour and be part of a salt mine, which is the deepest salt mine in the United States. And it's at the bottom of Cayuga Lake, which is actually below where I'm sitting right now. So I'm actually probably on top. I'm probably about 2,300 feet above the salt mine chambers as we speak, which is really weird to think about, right? (laughs) Um, But I had an opportunity to tour that salt mine yesterday and learn how Cargill is implementing safety and human performance. So safety in uh, the veg management arena has to be a little different than, you know, traditional industry and some of the other things you did. So how are we different? The most significant way that that safety and veg management is different is the high level variability, the high level of variability with 
the work. Every tree is different. And I heard that early on. Every tree is different. With the worker, you know, we have um, uh, endemic. It's endemic that we have a high level of turnover. So we have a lot of new workers always coming in to our business and with with the, the workplace. So we talk about work worker and workplace. And you can think about the workplace as the conditions that we're working in, like the weather, you know, we're, fit, we're working outside in all kinds of elements. So one of my colleagues from Ohio State, Asher Bakken, when he was introduced to our work, he said, your work is among the most highly variable he'd ever seen, second only to the special forces. And when he said that to us, and he said that to us early on in our journey at Lewis Tree, then we realized that traditional safety wasn't going to work for us, and we had to figure out how to do safety differently. And that's what we've been working on the past roughly four years now. The salt mines and some of this other stuff that you had touched, was that part of a previous project, or is that during your time at Lewis? Uh, well, with the salt mines, it was is with my current role at Lewis. So oh, wow. my current role is Director of Resilience and Reliability, and we, um, we've had some challenges with our equipment, um, uh, people, people being injured by our own equipment, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And so part of what I, w- I went to learn in the salt mine was how do they control that? How do they uh, control the space around I the equipment? You. So it was a great opportunity for us to learn how to better manage that risk as well. Oh, I got you. Okay. What, so how is your success quantified, right? So, you know, let's say there's a problem and they bring you in, right? And, and you are... Um, putting an, a process in place, a structure, a system. And then as time goes on, you can point and say, okay, hey, look, oh, we started here and now we're here. What are those metrics that define success from your perspective? So from my perspective, the way that we can define success is that we've had fewer serious injuries. And so, for example, when I started, um, we had just had a fatality of a person who was struck by wood. So we focused in pretty heavy on that risk. And you can definitely tell that over the four years, uh, we've had a reduction in serious, uh, serious close calls related to that as well as serious injuries related to that. So uh, that would be probably the most important way that you can measure success is that you have a reduction in serious injuries and fatality. But that being said, uh, the other ways that you can tell are probably more qualitative than quantitative. And for example, uh, it would be the conversations that occur. So every week we have a, our safety leadership call. And as part of that call, we review the close calls that came in that, that prior week. And we usually are getting about more than 100 a week now, which is a huge accomplishment. So the the depth of learning that occurs during those conversations, the language that's used, which exemplifies new view safety, is one way that you can tell. And in fact, some of my colleagues uh, from other domains, uh, such as naturalistic decision making or other safety researchers have been part of our conversations. And time after time, one of the things I hear is we can't believe how mature your thinking is and the conversations that I hear for example, um, the conversations around how we manage uncertainty. So I, congrats, because I think that what you guys are doing seems ahead of the curve. And, and specific to your peer group, call it um, trimming, pruning focused companies, do you feel that you guys are leading the industry in this area or are exactly where everyone is behind? Like, where do you kind of feel you are relative to your direct peer group? Um, I'm going to say that we are leading, and I have some grounding for making that bold statement. (laughs) No, I like Uh, it. (laughs) There was an industry conference recently, and I wasn't at this one. But I heard heard that one of our competitors put up a slide with uh, my photo on it, although leave this part out because I don't (laughs) want that. But but basically crediting Lewis Tree for uh, having – for leading the industry in how we're thinking about safety. Yep. Uh, line clearance traditionally was pretty punitive. In fact, Lewis is punitive. If you violated a rule, you got automatic three days off. And um, it, and I think that that was pretty 
uh, I think that was the standard through industry, and now the industry is definitely moving to uh, a more more of a, a, a role where we're learning, we're valuing people, and the, and what they bring to safety. It would seem that a uh, close call reporting system and a punitive approach wouldn't be real compatible. They're not real compatible. And in fact, uh, you know, a really good way that you can tell if you've got trust is the, the quality of the close calls that, you're, that are getting reported. So if you're not hearing about hardly any close calls, then you know something's probably broken because they're occurring. Now, we're at the other end of the, of a, of the challenge right now, which is that, uh, as I mentioned before, we're getting more than 100 a week. Like a couple of weeks, we've gotten about 130 a week. And they're really good quality. I mean, they're real, they're real close calls, serious things that have happened. And then the next challenge is, what do you do with that, that treasure trove of information? Because it is a gift. This is a great initiative, right? And it's an important one. And um, now I'm going to make a bold statement in saying that, you know, safety is this very broad term. We all know it's important. Um, every client, every company, every provider of it, you know, rallies around the word. Often what I've observed is where the inconsistency lies sometimes is, you know, when it comes down to it or there's budgets, like most of what I've observed is a very reactive approach, um, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, right. And, and, and so is part of your uh, journey been to, are you kind of also selling the idea of like the ROI and the, the cost side of it? Because typically what I've found is like, they're like, okay, well, mm -hmm. what is this gonna cost me? And even though we're talking about safety, Right. There's a tagline of it's important, but then, OK, well, how do I balance important with money? So, yeah, where has that factored in and how have you been able to to be so effective and convincing uh, with wherever you've gone? Well, that's a, uh, OK. So, uh, you know, that wouldn't have been my approach necessarily, but I can share with you some things that I've noticed about that. Um, one thing I've noticed about that, or we've noticed over these past four years, is that our EMR has gone down, and it's very low right now, which is an indicator of how much incidents are costing us. Uh, it's an insurance industry rating, and uh, we've noticed that it's gone down. So we know that our incidents or our total spend on incidents has gone down, and I think it's pretty interesting and unique, maybe not unique, but it seems unique to me in my experience that the line clearance industry, that when you do have a serious incident, in addition to the heartbreak associated, you know, with something happening to your team member, you, it can result in you losing uh, work because contracts are based on our incident rates and such. And so it's very real. The, the link to, um, uh, profitability, the ability to work is very tightly linked to our safety record. So from that standpoint, you know, the, you have to think about that from return on invest, no, investment that, that, as well. That, that's really, um, that's really thoughtful. Like you're right, because there's, let's put the emotional and the sadness piece here, because we know that first and foremost is the most important thing. Uh, but from the cost perspective, like, yeah, ins you're right, insurance, premiums, and, you know, downtime and all that sort of thing. Because, look, it, it, it's, you guys are in a very high-risk business. What I've also found, though, in the line clearance side of things is, um, you know, getting sort of that turnover, right? So it, it's a high turnover industry. So getting the stickiness of culture um, and, you know, that transfer of knowledge because you've got 100 people that you've spent time with and they understand your culture and now you're swapping out 50 and now there's 50 new people that I can see that continuity being very challenging. Um, and so, yeah, it's your, your former colleagues point of like, there's so many variables I can see because I've, I've, we see it from a very different perspective because we are not in the line clearance business. We are in the, um, kind of QA, QC, uh, doing essentially every high value service around the conductor minus the actual pruning, trimming, right? Phil, do you like how I'm I'm no longer saying cutting? I'm very proud of the fact that like- <laughs> I saw you snuck pruning in there oh, yeah. with I'm, trimming. I'm, I'm like, 
I'm trying to be like an industry leader here with the word pruning now because I get in the trouble from a lot of folks and they're like, it's not cutting, dude. You can't say cutting. I'm like, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I went to there, Tush, because I had to learn a new language as well when I came over. I'm still yeah, learning it. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, we, what you're doing is really innovative, very exciting. Um, yeah. Like Now, do you um, – is Lewis – uh, very open to like having you and, and, and the broad organization partner with other industry peers to, you know, collaborate, you know, thought leadership, continue to grow. Is that something that you guys focus on as well? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of what led to my work with Sub C7 because uh, uh, the safety researcher uh, is actually probably one of the, the leading global experts in human performance, David Proven. He studied under Sidney Decker. Uh, but uh, we did a little bit of trading where, you know, Dave said he'll help us internally. And, um, and then Lewis agreed for me to work with him on the project to support sub C7 uh, because it, it was a win-win the way that we saw it. And we have an opportunity to learn from Dave and from sub C7 and um, we have an opportunity to work together. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we're working on is uh, applying some of the things that we've done at Lewis, some of the things that are innovative, some tools that we've invented, for example, um, and coming up with a new set of principles for new view safety that are really grounded in the ideas of resilience engineering and all around uh, building adaptive capacity. So kind of a move away, or maybe I should say an expansion to the ideas of just managing error with human performance. Are there any new programs or new tools that you want to tell us about that you've been working on? Two of the tools that we've invented, which I think are working really well, are uh, our uncertainty gauge. And so the idea behind the uncertainty gauge is that the things that are most likely to kill people are when they can't control a situation or where they're highly uncertain. And I'm going to give Todd Conklin credit for that. I kind of have an aha moment when I was reading one of his books on fatality prevention. And so the whole idea of it, of the uncertainty gauge, is that if you have a one, that means I can control the situation. I'm pretty certain, and I'll use the example of uh, felling a tree. I'm pretty certain how this tree is going to come down. If it's a 10, it means that there are things about the situation that I can't control. Maybe I've got dead wood overhead that I can't reach and I'm uncertain how it's going to come down. So we use this idea of the uncertainty gauge to help, first of all, notice when we're feeling a higher level of uncertainty. And then that's a signal to call for help right? Usually raise it up to your general foreman and the general foreman uh, might bring in a different piece of equipment or a crew with different skills to, to do the job. So that's one tool that we've invented and in that actually our, our general foreman love that tool. Recently at a leadership meeting, they said that was their favorite human performance tool. So I'm kind of proud of that. I mean, to actually invent a human performance tool that people use. So, <laughs> That's great. Um, the uncertainty yeah. gauge. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The uncertainty yeah. gauge. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty simple. Well, Beth, I know we were planning on, um, you know, spending time with you and doing a, a, almost a series like this being the first of, you know, a second part and a third part. Um, so we're going to leave some some of that stuff uh, for our next set, you know, next time together um, in our next recording. But before we go for today, I, I do have one more question, and that's more centered around, you know, you're a thought leader and you're you're forging ahead in this resilience engineering uh, path. How are you thinking about the future in terms of the, the the Beth lays that are coming up? How are you? How is what you guys do? How are you fostering the next group of thought leaders and the community so that the great work that you've led and the foundation that you've built gets carried on and built upon? Hmm. Well, I think most certainly within Lewis, uh, the the leaders who uh, are, are the leaders within Lewis, once you adopt it, it's a different way of thinking and a different way of looking at work. The questions that you ask are different. So they embody it at this point and they will take it forward within Lewis of that. I'm really confident. But we also have uh, I'm the communications chairperson of the Resilience Engineering Association and we're getting ready to have, we have a, a, a meeting every other year. We're having a meeting in September, or 
I'm sorry, in June. We're having a meeting in June. And we have a young talents group that we uh, are bringing along. And so the Resilience Engineering Association is pretty tightly associated with a couple of universities and labs at universities that That's great. Uh, I guess are developing new leaders in this area. Beth, we started off, we talked a little bit about uh, surprises. And I know we always talk about things that never happened before and things that never happened before happen all the time. You got any stories you want to share with us just as we leave? Sure. We had a, a team uh, in northern Pennsylvania that shared a close call with us recently. And we talk about, as you said, the things that never happened before happen all the time. And I think this was one of those. So we had a crew. They were working pretty far out in the wilderness. And uh, they had an eagle fly over and drop a full deer leg and barely missed our workers. Wow. Oh, my goodness. A deer leg, did you say? A deer leg, yeah. Wow, wow, okay. And talk about a close call yeah, that you didn't expect. Yes. An eagle, wow. a deer leg, and uh, that has yeah. to be something I'm, that I'm going to say that might be one of one in terms of like <laughs> happening. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, very interesting. Beth, thank you so much for today. And um, like I said, I can't wait to build on this conversation in our next in our next call, but this was awesome. This is so interesting. Thank you. Such a pleasure to meet you both. Yeah, pleasure to meet you, you as well. Beth. That's it for this episode of the Trees and Lines podcast, brought to you by Iapetus Infrastructure Services. If you like the show, please give us a rating of five stars on Apple or Spotify. If you have any questions or comments on any of our episodes or ideas for topics or guests in the future, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact us at treesandlines at iapetusllc.com. We'll chat with you soon.